in the land with the fans. Whole projects like the mold grass, smudges on pants. I live the draw, but I'm music waiting to explode. Wander the globe, sampling on the tapers and gold. The stage to unfold. The bitches rose crippling on a road tripping. Both the cats he saw clawed more like old kittens. The cold written says make a demo, so I grab a cast. No, like Wesley Willis says, heavy metal. Get recorded like Canadian masters. Make album after album till the alias crashes. Getting paid and experience. Both playing games holding true. Soon you're getting slayed and it's serious. We need to move in. On places to play on music, on stages to stay producing vocations and trades of cool and grow but they got plans. The business is to shake your hands. Give me a mic, I'm lighting up to make a man. Yeah, I'm aiming at a fabulous sort to smith classify like savages, but it's other pacifists. I don't wanna take you on MPR. Protesting with a sign that says no bad cars. If you're for laws and women off of Venus, if you interest me, no one must be home in space greetings. Jesus, just another reason to spark those people walk around running like villains with charcoal. Yo, a second, give me an hour The old Tommy corruption got my city sour We got the city hall, you asking me to sign Look up, man, it's time to rock the microphone live Yeah, straight from the 215 I never trip over lyrics and my shoes untied Yes, I'm back with the wisdom act With the system mad to the math With the vision, watch your own back with the rhythm Everywhere I go, people smoking trees Everywhere I go, and see local slow and poetry I'm believing everyone thinks of this shit Some men for most can't keep up with the clip It's still slick, turn and beat the stars just like Juan Carter It comes to rap I'm a lucky bastard Don't want fathers Rich without the founders Look call me out of town I clown around I check the internet To count the data Breaking boards and message boards And electric swords Randomized Standardized Test the scores Best to glorify I wanted to start with that film for, for three reasons. One is um, I like the music. Um, the second one, it's, um, it was actually made not for, for this kind of audience. It was made for us. We're having a, we have two big company meetings every year. So that was made in the summer to really kind of to celebrate ourselves. So it's us talking to ourselves about ourselves. And as I was preparing for this, and I'll give you the third reason in a second, but as I was preparing for this, I thought it really uh, presented to me a a different kind of perspective of the Fallen's than the one we talk about. You know, we're really proud to have helped um, create some of, the, some of the, you know, greatest brands in the last uh, 50 years that the Fallen's has been in existence. But there is, a, I'm always kind of bugged by the perfection of the, the, the perfectly executed um, application that we use to talk about what we do, you know. The brand at its complete, finished, done state. And what I like about that film, and, and the third thing, is it really gave me a sense of what I wanted to talk about today, which is, by and large, on a daily basis, we're making a mess. And if you look in the office, if you look at the nature of the interaction in the office, it's a messy place, the processes are messy, and I actually think branding is increasingly a really kind of messy, lots of people have to get involved in it. The, the discipline itself is going through, I think, a fundamental shift, and, I think technology, but also some changes in culture, are meaning that where branding used to kind of sit at an intersection, I think, between, say, corporate strategy, where the organization is trying to go, and communication, how it talks about itself. I think we still have that corporate strategy, but what's the ambition of an organization, its vision, all those kinds of things. But I think the intersection that matters more is, is, is no longer with communication, but actually closer to service and product innovation, the things the organization makes. Because increasingly, people's perception of a brand isn't in, in what it says and it's kind of on a billboard far away on a TV ad. It's in the products and the services and the experiences that people have. So I like this notion, as dangerous as it is, I like this notion of saying that what we do is, is, is make a mess. And, I, and those two things are, matter to me at Wolf Orleans. Making, because a brand is less about what you represent, it's more about what you do, and we have to get involved in the making process. And the mess, and I'll talk about that in, in five different ways. I think the, the place where branding happens, the actual activity happens, the process that we go through, the products of branding, what actually comes up from branding, the people and the interaction between those people, and finally the problems that branding should solve are all really, really messy. And if we don't get involved in branding and the messy bits of it, if we continue to kind of talk about branding in this pure, refined, complete stage, I don't think will be valuable to our clients. Maybe more importantly, I don't think will be valuable to society. So I'll go through those five areas one by one, and in each of them, I'll kind of show, I'll do my best to kind of show a bit more of the behind-the-scenes stuff as opposed to the finished product. 
Um, and I'll try and capture what I think that means, both for the discipline of branding and what a brand is in the 21st century. This is the first time I'm giving this talk, and I think this is part of the point itself. I, myself, am still exploring these notions, and really, I'm here for the next few days. I'd love different insights and perspectives on that. So, the first one, place, the place of branding. We, we um, in London, we have a, a wonderful building. Many people here have been there. And in the kind of marketing material, we show it again, and it's beautiful. This is actually our New York office. It was designed by the same people that designed um, the, the Apple store, the Apple store, so 8 Inc. And when a photographer is coming, you can make the place look absolutely fantastic. And creative spaces, and this is not ours, but creative spaces, um, when we talk about them, we almost have this sort of perfection notion about them. My worry with this kind of thinking about the creative space is that it's not far off from this. The kind of the, the controlled nature of work, which is absolutely the opposite of, of creative spaces. And what I like about our space, and I think that, that film, and the reason why I want to show that film what it does, is it really describes the Morial. This is the same New York office without preparing. And I promise you, and I'll go back, you're always going to get more creativity from that space than that one. But if you think that's messy, I'll show you, and that's the New York office. Here's some stuff from the London office. This is where people work. Where people work has to be able to, to be messy. People's desks have to be able to be a, a manifestation of themselves. Um, increasingly in a world of, again, when, I, when I'm talking about making a world of hacking things together, it's a messy place. Um, and even, I was talking to somebody, we have a knitting club. And it's amazing how knitting gets involved and this is a real thing you'll see in a second, gets involved in the branding process. So, increasingly our work is about getting into the places where brands exist as opposed to sitting away and doing stuff. So some studies here done by the Skype team, and I'll talk to you a bit about the Skype work, are really about going into the places and observing people in the way, again, service and product design does, as opposed to communication design, really getting into the environment, into the place where people use those brands. <laughs> and what this has done for the Skype team is that we've, it's allowed us to create a brand that is, again, less on the pedestal and much closer to the real behaviors that people have when they use Skype. And for those of you that use Skype, there are all sorts of interesting things that happen. And here are some more. And my favorite one is the one in the lower, kind of that when, when somebody's not quite there yet and you see the, the little space and the belly and the chest hairs pe peek out. Um, is the reality of using Skype, it's the thing that connects to people. And is absolutely fan fantastic material for creating a brand. And so that's the language that we use to create the Skype brand. It is about the reality, the imperfections, the messiness of using Skype. If you use Skype, it's never perfect, then there's no point trying to pick the perfect picture. And it leads to a really fantastic, in our opinion, language that is much closer to the product and the experience than any kind of message you're trying to tell but actually is also really powerful in terms of creating just simple stories that could actually be ads. you're lucky. <laughs> and similarly, here's the sock puppet that came from the knitting team. <laughs> so, so brands really live in this kind of real space. Um, that is, actually makes the point that the place where people experience the brand is almost as important, if not more important, than actually what the branding is. And capturing that is a powerful thing. Now, that's 
super important in the process of branding. For those of you who are looking at that profession, for us, it's less about sitting in offices and imagining things. And again, like great product and service designers, it's about this developing and designing the brand where it is used in people's lives. And those kinds of brands can actually continue to have a massive impact in people's lives. So I think it turns out that the place itself is as important as the thing. And often, the messier, the closer to real life it is, and real life is messy, the better. So that's about the place. The second one I wanted to talk about was actually the process. What do you create in the branding process, and, and, and how is that useful to people? And if you've, whether you work in branding or not, you've seen this, the, if you like, the hero product of brand consultancy, which is the guideline. And some people have the nerve to call it the Bible, you know, the brand Bible, this inert controlling mechanism for brands. And we've all seen them. Well, I'm increasingly of the belief that those things don't work. We don't live in a world, in a world where brands are made as opposed to communicated, where we can't control that. Who the hell am I to tell an engineer what he can make and what he can't make? <laughs> And if you think about the processes, if branding is a process that matters, if you think about the processes that matter to people, democracy, relationships, change, they're all really messy things. And we're becoming increasingly comfortable with the notion that our, what we do in the branding process is, is not at all to control, but to kind of inject some inspiration, create some start points for people to make stuff. Last year, we, um, we it's now, 18 months ago, we helped launch um, a big a new brand in the UK called EE. EE was the bringing together of brands that you will know about, Orange and T-Mobile, into one new operator just in the UK. The idea was that you didn't just want yet another mobile phone company. This was a brand that had to help people do things they could never do before. So the idea be behind it was now you can. And this has to be the brand that shows everybody in the UK how the magic of technology can make their lives better. The branding approach to it was this thought, and it was a thought that had lots of studies you could do around it, around a smart layer. Technology is all around us, but more importantly, the things we want to do with it are all around us. So this, the EE brand is a smart, it's called a smart layer, and the smart layer unites to make things happen. So what I'm going to show you is a messy study that we did, which really was the fundamental deliverable. And then in a second after that, I'll show you what that, how that then was adopted by engineers, customer service people, ad agencies, social media agencies, to create what was the real brand that people can experience in the world. Try and bear that in mind, and, and as I play the reality of it, for those of you particularly who don't live in the UK who might be seeing this brand for the first time, kind of just in your mind think about the similarities and I think more importantly the differences, because the differences are the point around why you can't control a brand. When I look at, the e, when I look at EE and the success of that brand, I know that um, Wolf Owens might have sown a seed, but the real success is hundreds of people, literally hundreds of people who took that seed and made something special out of it.
Thank you. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't take responsibility, but I'm going to show you two little clips that actually don't have to do with the EE job, but they're increasing the kinds of tools that we're given other teams, and as I said with EE, there were, I think it's 24 different agencies after we did those initial, that initial intent work that had to get involved to build things. So what do you give them in a world where um, you don't want to give them controlling guidelines? And sometimes it's just little bits of advice and experience that you've had along the way. You know, you've got to really run a, a tight ship around at the space that you've got. So there's a car, it was normally full of people. But, um, doesn't look that neat, does it? But it was, it was organized chaos. And the other thing that was really important for this was how we structured our days as a team. So meeting up in the morning, first thing, to discuss everyone's roles and responsibilities and objectives for the day. And then meeting up at the end of the day to see how everyone was, had done so we didn't spend, had to spend so much in the morning going back over everything. And I guess that's kind of close to an agile methodology without all the rules and bullshit that goes on in the middle of it, just the most important bits, which is making sure everyone connects regularly. So really rough and ready tools that allow the masses of people who are going to have to make this brand successful, that don't control them, don't tell them you can't do this and you can't do that, and the logo has to sit in that corner and be controlled by this level of exclusion, but actually just inspires them about what is the germ of an idea when they get their hands on it. We think that, therefore, branding isn't about creating these wonderful artifacts, the perfect, elegant solution. Actually, what you're doing is using design as an instigator, a disruptor, kind of... A, encouraging people to break the norm to do something different. Because that's what brands have to do. If a brand kind of arrives in its category, in its space, and sounds the same as the other one, uses the same kind of propositions as the other one, offers its service the same as the other one, it will not be successful. And so the most powerful thing a brand can do is to inspire people in the organization to do something new. Third one is products. So what are the products of brand? And, and in this world where you can tweet this, print a car, there's one out there, print a gun even, um, there's also, there's just an incredible power for making that goes into people's hands, and it's not always used well. So, and in our view, what you really want to do when you create products in the branding, in the branding world is um, put things into people's hands that begin the conversation between you and them. And so, the work I'm about to show is just a quick study we did for Orange. We're, we're helping Orange really rethink that brand for the 21st century, particularly with an emphasis on Africa, where a lot of its future growth will be. The idea is simple enough, particularly if you think about that they offer mobile services. The idea is listen and respond, but kind of that listen then respond, that kind of thought. And if I test that in typical branding way, um, I'll get typical answers about that. And if I test it in typical products, I'll get the typical answers. So increasingly, our first deliverable in, the, in branding is a product, um, a prototype like Jake that you talked about earlier that you're going to put into people's hands and learn from them. And sometimes all it is is a, a, a forcing mechanism to get people to give you some different perspective. And for Orange, what we just created was a, a box, and we sent it around the world and just recorded what people what it made people think. And this is what this is about. Ça serait une alarme quelque part, je sais pas. Ça pourrait être l'alarme auprès d'un prestataire. Ou de... Vous savez pas ce qu'il y a dedans c'est de dire que c'est ma boîte à, boîte à rêve ou ma boîte à secret, je mettrai dedans tout ce que j'ai envie de réaliser mm -hmm. euh, et pour ne pas les oublier, quelquefois j'ouvrirai pour voir ce que je m'étais mis comme objectif et voir si ma vie a avancé. Well, my father has diabetes, I'd like to cure Oui, faire une espèce de transatlantique entre la Guadeloupe et la France pour aller plus vite, quelque chose qui prendrait peut-être, euh, je sais pas moi, même pas 10 minutes. Très très rapide, très très rapide, voilà. Yeah, it could take the precious moments and put it, yeah, yeah, it could keep the precious moments when you press the button. Si j'appuie le bouton, j'aimerais bien que Sénégal devienne la plus grande, la, le, le pays fasse partie des pays développés de, du monde en fait. 
genre ça te dit les objets que j'ai perdus. J'aimerais bien la boîte là, ma porte des Guinéens et de la popularité. It would turn on some kind of light that would attract everyone to come. I need to remember something. I would remind me. Si moi, personnellement, j'avais cette boîte et tout, en l'appuyant, si je pouvais aller dans mon pays et revenir à chaque moment, et les gens qui me manquaient, genre, euh, si je pouvais aller les revoir et tout, bah, ça serait une très bonne chose. C'est tout. A simple thing like a box that goes around the world has really changed the way Orange think about their brand and what they have to do in the world. And for us, beginning to think about the process of branding less around communication and representation and more around product changes our business. One of the things we did recently, um, and we've been inspired by some of the people in this room, including Tom, who came to our offices last year and really encouraged us to turn things into software. If you have a repeatable process, why don't you turn it into software, which is something we've started doing. But actually, one of the really simple ideas we have in terms of a product that we've gone to market with is, is this. Higby is here to gently remind us what matters. His face blocks your headphone jack, so you tune into the people around you, not your latest download. His heart covers the camera lens, so you really taste the turkey instead of Instagramming it. And his arms wrap around your phone and a friend's, hugging them together, so you're wholly there and not half-checking emails. Higby, a little experiment in perspective. What one? That's a Higby. <laughs> the, the thing has fallen out. I've got 27 more after my talk. Um, um, so, brands will primarily exist in a world where we're discovering about them ourselves. They will primarily exist in the services, the experience, and the products that organizations create. And so we think that our job is to really get close to the people who build those products and actually be, have, be an influence on the people who communicate what that organization does, but make sure that we're communicating the reality of the organization. Because this gap that continues to exist between what organizations say about themselves and what they actually do is bad for cons customers, is bad for those businesses, and it's bad for all of us. And bringing that together is a really uh, big objective for us. Just two more bits of this, two more Ps that I'll talk about. Um, this one is about people and it's about who you get involved in the process and what your objectives are in the process. And one of the things that I think we're comfortable about now is um, we're not in the business of creating superstars of ourselves. Um, the EE brand is maybe we were involved in creating that seed and we continue to be advisors and helpers and partners and collaborators of them, but it just takes so many people to do that. And the notion of of the goal being to be superstars on a stage, he says, standing on a stage, is kind of the wrong mentality towards thinking about branding. What that does, though, is it forces us to involve um, lots of people in the process, which makes the, the whole thing look sometimes amateurish, but certainly messy. And we've come, for those of you who are in the UK who know when we launched 2012, which did go on to be a success, the kind of the, the pressure people have on you when you launch certain brands. We've gotten so comfortable about really um, people criticizing us about what they view as unprofessional and what we view as open and collaborative brands that people can get their hands on and mess them up, um, that we no longer get offended. But I was offended about this one because it says, isn't this just this? This is the work we did for Virgin Media, and when it launched, somebody said, isn't that just the same thing but done by a nine-year-old? I'm offended because it's true. It was done by a nine-year-old. And an eight-year-old. And a six-year-old who got it wrong at first, <coughs> but then got it right. Um, the other reason he got it, the last one got it wrong, is because that's my son. <laughs> um, so with, with Virgin Media, absolutely the form is still there, but what we were trying to do was liberate it from all these rules and make it that people could adopt and people could draw it. And we had different members of their organization drawing the logo. It became something that everybody could kind of adopt, literally get your hands on. 
But instead of having rules around it, you kind of get rid of those and say, what can you imagine with it? And people are imagining theme park rides on this. And you really have a brand that becomes something people can own and adopt. So this notion of getting people involved in it is really important. It moves you from what might be an orderly thing, the logo is in the right place, the colors are all the same, to something that really can be about possibilities and doesn't allow, it doesn't uh, demand that brand consultants be involved in any, everything, but that people can be really free about how they use the brand. And it means that if somebody has a great idea for one of their festivals where you're going to have two different uh, sets of glasses, and actually, yeah, you can do that. Go ahead and do it and make it something that really people can participate in. So for us, getting more and more people, not less and less people involved in the branding process is critical. It's critical for a business like ours as well, back to my earlier point, that has the benefit of its founding fathers being some of the gurus of Brandon and people who remain to this day incredibly positive forces on the business, even though they're not involved with it. Uh, Michael Wolf, in particular, will call me up just to offer advice or just to see how I'm doing, even though he left the company decades ago. They're really important people, gurus in the industry. But I don't think we're going to create gurus next. I think what we are now are much more hackers, makers, and collaborators, instigators that are actually helping our clients become something special. So I don't think it's our job to make heroes of ourselves. I think if it needs to be made by a nine-year-old, let it be made by a nine-year-old. I think our job is to put things in people's hands and encourage them to go, and go away and make stuff. Because a brand that can be created by tens and hundreds and thousands is obviously going to be much more powerful than one that's created by the 120 or so people who sit in an office in London. And then the final one I want to talk about, and this one is a slightly different one, um, is problems. Messy problems. And the attraction to messy problems in the branding process. And, and I say this one is important because um, it's important to me as a, as a Nigerian, as an African, because we are surrounded by messy problems. To get to school, I went to a primary school in a rural part of eastern Nigeria, so not in Lagos or Portakot or Abuja or any of those big places, in a rural area without electricity. To get to school on a daily basis and not get either hit by a bus or beat up by the school bully who, who in, was in my class but was 15 years older than me because people go to school late. <laughs> <laughs> to do that required amazing creativity. I think in, in Africa, we, creativity isn't an option as it is everywhere. You can't kind of make the choice. You have to be creative to survive. So it's a real advantage to us, the fact that we've had to live through working our way through messy problems. And for me, I think in my career, it's always been an advantage. Even when I went to architecture school in America, I always realized that the ability to think through things, to, 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 to understand that systems don't always work. Because in, in, growing up in Africa, you kind of don't expect the system, whether it's government or police or anything, to work in your favor. And so you have a natural inclination to design around the system. That's always been, that's an incredible power, incredibly powerful tool for designers. And that's why I'm really encouraged, and I really think that there will be an amazing design um, uh, ecosystem and ecology that emerges out of Africa as we begin to really engage with these issues. And it's one of the reasons why Brian Boylan, our chairman, said to me in 2010 when he asked me to be the MD, because of that ability to see things from a different perspective. But it's worth saying, these problems we talk about in Africa, um, and not just in Africa. Systems everywhere are either not fit for purpose, corrupt, broken. Whether you're thinking about food, or energy, or money, or healthcare, these systems are not working. And I can't think of a bigger challenge for designers anywhere in, this, in the times we're living in to use digital technologies and new creative tools to begin to help society think through those problems. And particularly, um, on a real personal level today, I'm particularly aware of this. This is the front of my house in, as I said, I'm from eastern Nigeria. I took this picture three days ago. I was there for a funeral of a loved one who died right on that spot 20 days ago. Standing by the side of the road, no power. And what happens when there's no power is that every single one of those shops, and those are all shacks, each, there, there are at least 15 different shops happening there, pulls out their generator. So imagine it's dark, it's 8 p.m., 
there's all this sound going on, you can't hear a thing. A motorcyclist comes in the other direction, he's turned off his lights because he thinks that's going to save him um, um, petrol. My guy had no chance. He was hit on the side of the road, died on the spot. We've got these problems sitting right in front of us, and I don't think there's anything else for designers to do than to think about how we use creativity and design to solve those kinds of problems so that stuff like that doesn't happen. The, one of the um, great examples, and I will end on this, that I think does that is Little Sun. We are development partners with Olaf Eliasson on creating this. It really is a work of art, and he, I think he is one of the, he reminds me a bit of Thomas Heatherwick, who's speaking later on, one of the great, my, one of my great heroes at the moment. Um, so a work of art, but there's also, the goal is to put that in the hands of the 1.6 billion people around the world who don't have access to um, reliable, safe energy. How do you think about that? I think rather than me trying to explain that, let me end with a fairly long film that explains what Little Sun is. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Peter.